Thank you very much. First of all, I would also like to thank Fred and Anita for inviting me here to New York and to honor your achievements in science. Um, I would like to support everything that has been said about Fred before, and I want to add something to that. So uh, Fred has been a wonderful collaborator for me, and one thing that I um, especially appreciate is maybe we can tell you what I don't like about collaborators and then you will see why I like to work with Fred so much. So what I like, don't like so much is if you talk to people a lot and they keep traveling and nothing happens on the project because they're never at home, they're not really interested in pushing it forward. And uh, Fred has always been very much behind the projects and everything we initiated I could rely on his work and you start to do something and then it doesn't work, so you need to have new peptides or an alternative. And then often other people say, oh, it's too much work and I don't have a student working on it and then the project is dead. And Fred has always continued with me on this journey. And um, another thing that I actually want to, manage, uh, to mention is sometimes you have stupid ideas, I have many stupid ideas, and then you talk to somebody and if he then will accept your stupid idea, you will kill his lab and afterwards you will kill your lab. And so therefore it's very helpful to have actually a critical colleague, uh, which Fred has been always, and I have really appreciated his, his criticism and his advice. And I think it's, he's a true gentleman. I think criticism is never bad. It's just the way you express it. And I think I, I, in, in that way, it was a very enjoyable uh, journey that we made to, uh, up to this point. Now, um, how do I know Fred? Actually, the first time he was mentioned to me by Tom Muir. So Tom Muir gave a talk. John Robinson invited him once to our institute. And I, I talked to him and I said, well, I, we were working about ligands for GPCRs, neuropeptide Y, and I said, I would like to move towards the receptors. Uh, would you be interested? And he said, well, it's not really my area of interest, but I know a good colleague from New York, and that's Fred Nader, and he would be very competent to do that with you. And then later on, a little bit later on, I actually met him. It was in Prague on the European Peptide Symposium and actually also together with Jeff Backers. They always come in two. And, and so we were, I was standing in front of their poster and they were showing a, a proton 15 and correlation of a, I will show it in a minute. And so I, I stood in front of the poster and said, well, this is a nice spectrum and maybe I could do something for you so maybe I can talk to them. And we talked to each other and, and this was this, the beginning of the collaboration. He then visited me in Zurich a little later on and, and it has continued since then. So what I want to do today, I want to talk a little bit about what we've done the last 10 years together, and most of it will not be new to you, Fred, I apologize, uh, but there will be also something that I think you haven't seen yet. Okay, um, G-protein coupled receptors don't really need much introduction. First, crystal structure came out in 2000 uh, by Chris Palczewski was a breakthrough at that time, revealed the overall structure. Now we are NMR people, and particularly solution NMR, and there is no true structure of a G-protein coupled receptor, but there are structures of 70M proteins, and from the Niedlisbach lab, the sensory rhodopsin was a true achievement um, at that time. Uh, another one is on proto-rhodopsin from the lab of Volker Dutch in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Frankfurt. And, and both of these structures were quite well defined. And there's no true GPCR structure. And the reason is those molecules are much more stable than GPCRs. And that I will come back to this a little later on. There is a solid state structure of a true GPCR from the lab of Stan Opeller. But there was a lot of modeling data going into that, so it's a kind of a semi-structure. It's not quite a full structure yet, I would say, if you allow. Um, so what are the problems that we have when we go into this? I mean, there's a lot of biochemical problems that um, these proteins are large, they're not really stable, they don't express very well, they're difficult to purify and refold, they may be 
carry post-translational modifications. And then for NMR, there's a, an extra is the labeling, so that limits a little bit the hosts that we can use. We need to deuterate, and so we also need to find a, a optimal detergent environment. And so the biochemical problems are low expression levels. Um, this was actually problems that were mostly solved in Fred Nader's lab when we collaborated on the fragments and uh, work from Lea and, and Katrina there supported us very much. Um, then we also have lo even much lower expression levels in deuterated water that we need. Maybe we have problems with the purifications because they don't bind very well to the nickel affinity columns. Then there's a problem with the cleavage afterwards. Uh, we often have problems with the, with the solubility of the constructs. Then another annoying thing is that the deuterated proteins often behave very differently than the protonated ones in terms of solubility, aggregation behavior, and so. And that, that's really annoying because you think you're almost there and you make the deuterated protein and then you start a new project. Um, and then refolding, of course, could be uh, another issue. Uh, and then if to, there's another list of problems in the spectroscopy, so they are large. They are protein detergent complexes, which makes our life even uh, more complicated because it adds to molecular weight. Another issue that we have, and it's actually, I think, the more serious issue is conformational exchange effects because they are inherently less stable um, proteins. Then maybe we need per deuterated detergents. That's not always required. Uh, we need to deuterate the protein. And, and, uh, and I mentioned it already that the perdeuterated protein sometimes behaves differently than the protonated ones. Samples are not really stable, at, particularly at higher temperature, and there's other, other problems as we go along. So there's two systems that we worked in our lab, and I will mainly focus on the work on the ST2P receptor, and I will just very briefly mention a project on the NPY receptor because there we had some complementary data. Um, we use NMR, and so for the NMR uh, specialists here in the audience, I apologize. I want to say a few words. So basically, one spectrum that we pay a lot of attention to is the proton 15N correlation map. Gives you one peak per non-proline residue with uh, a few side chain resonances. The coupling is large, so usually the experiment works very well, and you get fairly well-resolved spectrum. If this spectrum doesn't look good, then we never start the project at all. So we need to have a reasonable spectrum there. And so you can have proton-nitrogen correlations, also proton-carbon correlations. Both will usually work very well. And then the kind of structure work that we do, we classically Structural, structures of proteins or structures of biomolecules are solved based mainly on NOEs. Um, they are distance dependent. Um, the problem is we don't really get many uh, meaningful long-range NOEs in membrane proteins, and I will come back to that. That's why the whole business gets so complicated. Then we use something which is called paramagnetic relaxation enhancements, or PREs, where we actually covalently attach a probe to the protein, which is uh, paramagnetic, and then this leads to relaxation in a certain distance-dependent manner, and we can pick it up, and we see signal reductions, and then we know how far um, the moiety is from the spin label. And another fairly recent development are residual dipolar couplings, and in this technique, what you do is you add something to your buffer, which is um, aligning in the field. So those are disc-shaped molecules, um, could be phospholipid discs, and then the protein, um, so to say, interferes sterically or electrostatically a little bit with these discs, and then it becomes slightly aligned, and this introduces dipolar couplings, which we can measure and use for determining structures. Now the advantage over NOEs is if you want, for example, to look here, you have two helices and you want to know whether they're parallel or aligned in a certain angle. If you use NOEs, you would just look at a very few NOEs at the crossing of the two helices and that would be fairly imprecise. Whereas if you use these RDCs, you basically get restraints all along the helices and you would just see the relative orientation in, in, in much more detail and much more unambiguously. Okay, so the membrane models that are available 
we did almost all the work in detergent mice cells, liposomes we can't really use, they are too large for solution NMR. We worked a little bit on bicells. We worked an awful lot on nano disks the last three years with very little success, a little bit. It's very complicated work. We're not quite sure whether we'll ever get there. But um, they are interesting system in that they um, provide a true bilayer other than a, a detergent mice cell. They also seem to stabilize the proteins fairly well, but to incorporate the proteins into these nano disks uh, and is complicated, and then also the overall size is fairly large. Okay, so strategies for getting to GPCRs. Um, I said they are large, so what Basically, my work with Fred was to take it apart. That's actually his idea initially, I need to say. And so we would then study these fragments individually and learn about the structures of the fragments. I want to show you that we learn particularly something about the folding. Um, and what we want to do in the end, we want to put back this information into Spectre and try that it helps us with the structure of the entire receptor. That's more wishful thinking at the moment, but um, I hope it will work out in the future. Then another project that we always talked about is to make complementary fragments, and then we could label one of them, and then they would, for, that's been shown for a couple of receptors, for C2P as well, and that they will form a, a, a signaling competent complex, and then we could label just one of those. That's an idea where we have done a lot but not been that successful. Another idea is to make fragments of extending size, and that's something I will talk about. So basically, we start with, from the end terminus with the helix one, we add helix two, we add helix three, and then we see whether they mutually stabilize or influence each other. Um, and one project that we've also done I don't want to talk about is we've grafted the loops of a GPCR on another scaffold. Um, okay, so what is the justification of working with fragments? If you would take a soluble protein and express it at pieces, then usually you will get, end up with insoluble protein fragments that will aggregate and not be folded or well behaved at all. So with membrane proteins it's a little bit different and if you look at the membrane folding model from um, Popo and Engelmann, what they say, well, the, the protein, when it comes, uh, it partitions into the interface, it will form secondary structure, and then the individual helices will insert into the membrane, they will diffuse in the membrane, and they will form then the bundle. This is the model that's out, and because of that, individual helices, they should form secondary structure already. That's something that this model says, and that's, that would justify working with fragments. Okay, now there's a caveat, and that is if you, this is the 7TM bundle, and this is all the interactions that you would see in the 7TM bundle, and if you take a fragment, you potentially take a lot of interactions out because the interacting partner is not present. And those are often polar interactions, so what happens is you, you um, expose polar residues to lipids, and that is potentially causing trouble, and, and so this is something you need to keep in mind. So what did we learn from our studies? And now I'll tell you a little bit of what we've done in the last 10 years. It's all started with TM7, that was, I think, a construct that Leah initially did, um, and it comprises the seventh uh, TM helis and a, a large fraction of the C-terminal tail, and this was the spectrum that Fred showed me on this APA, EPS meeting. That's what I saw uh, when I met him for the first time. All we did is we were adding the numbers to the spectrum, which is the assignment. Um, and to get to that, we used classical techniques, but he also made the differentially amino acid type labeled proteins, which helped to deconvolute the spectrum into uh, the various peaks. And uh, this is structure calculations now. And what you see is basically, it's a bit confusing. What I show there is an overlay of 20 conformers. And you see that some parts overlay very well and others not. And here I fitted the N-terminal part of the helix and here the C-terminal part of the helix. 
And what we see is that we have two helices, but their relative orientation is not well defined. So we don't have one straight helix, but instead we have an interruption at the terminus. There's a proline here, uh, and, and apparently that breaks the helices. And, and, and if you look at this uh, seventh helix on its own, then apparently it's not a stable single helix. And it's also the question what happens when it inserts into um, the membrane. And we, we looked at this with these uh, micelle integrating spin labels. So this inserts into a micelle, and then you have a spin label here, which is located at the interface, and a spin label here, which is located into the center. And we also had a spin label, which is actually located outside of the micelle. And what you see, if you look at this here, so if it were just a single TM crossing, you should see attenuations here and attenuations here at the, at the edges of the seventh TM. This is here the gray box. So this is what we see, but we also see attenuations here. So we see that there's internal parts of the, of the helix coming in contact with the micelle surface. So this also supports a little bit the the picture that is not a single helix, but an interrupted helix. Okay, then we made the construct a little longer. We were adding, oh no, this is actually, sorry. We went to the N-terminal fragment. Now this is TM1, TM2, with a little bit of the N-terminal part. This is the spectrum, a nice proton nitrogen correlation. Um, this is um, now a spectrum showing you the methyl groups in the proton carbon correlation. And I want to show you, this is partially deuterated material. And this is a protein in which all the methyl groups are protonated and all the rest of the protein is deuterated. Sounds a bit very sophisticated, but it helps a lot because you can see the sharpening of the signals because you take out a lot of these dipolar interactions. And actually, there's also a problem from the isotopomers. But you need to do a lot of biochemical work to get to good spectra. This is, the, this is the message. And with these type of spectra, you can get proper restraints. From this type of spectra, you can never even pick peaks. And another problem is um, with the detergent micelle. So you see very strong signals here because the detergent wasn't deuterated. If you can, uh, we then bought it deuterated. And then a lot of it clears up, and we can actually get to proper peaks. Now this is um, kind of um, data that you don't show so often anymore nowadays. But what is important here, you see the type of restraints that we see in the spectrum. And this is between residues and after three residues apart. And if you have a helix, after three residues, you have a full turn. And then residues become close and space again. And so this shows you actually that the structures that we calculate are really in the data. They're not somewhere from artificial restraints, but they're really in the data. Uh, and this is what the structure that we came up with published. Um, Alexei was, was the student in my lab at that time. And so we see the two helices, and we also see contacts between the two helices. Um, now, we worked. I said we also worked on a human NPY receptor, the Y4 receptor at that time. And actually, we had the same fragment there. And so this was the structure of this T2P that I showed you. And with the Y4 receptor, we never really got tertiary contacts. And also, the, the, the helices were not really where they were supposed to be. And so we were frustrated about this. And then we asked, why actually can we deter, why do we get tertiary structure here and not tertiary structure there? And this is, if you look now at the Y4 receptor and all what you see, all the side chains are from polar residues. And so you see here at TM1 and 2, there's a lot of polar residues. Now, if you take out the remainder of the receptor, all these polar residues cause trouble. Um, they prevent the helices to insert properly into the membrane, whereas with this D2P, you have much less polar residues. And, and so if this is a model of the Y4. So you see here there's a, there's a polar patch that's exposed to the lipid. And that prevents insertion of the membrane. And I think in this field, so what, what we learned is there are data on partitioning of individual amino acids into a membrane. You can, ca you can experimentally determine how much energy does it take to bring an alanine or 
a, a glutamate into a membrane environment. This has been determined by Stephen White and, and Wimley. And we found out if you sum that up over your TM uh, sequence, you get a very good predictor of how your helix will behave in such an environment. And you see here, this is the free energy of transferring TM1 from the Y4 into, and you see it's much, much less favorable than for this D2P. So we, this gives you a good idea, this simple biophysical data, how these helices will behave. Okay. Now, this is the project that I would really like to speak about. Um, this is something that we started, so I showed you uh, the structure of um, uh, TM1, TM2. And so then we asked, maybe we'll just do a series, just TM1, and then we make TM1, TM2, TM3 um, for two reasons. One, or actually for three reasons. So the first reason that we wanted to learn how they look like when, when we make larger parts of the receptor. Um, the second thing is a technical one. So I was interested to see if you make TM1, TM2, TM3, you have TM1, TM2 already contained. Can you transfer the NMR information from TM1, TM2 onto that fragment? And, and this is interesting because these large proteins will become more complicated in the analysis. So if you would have a tool to build up the large protein assignments from smaller fragments, that would be something that is interesting and would help us. And the third thing is, it's, that's actually something I didn't think about in the beginning, but I like this idea more and more the more I think about it, is you learn something about folding. Yeah? So if these poly, if the GPCRs fold, what happens is, from the ribosome, you first have TM1 coming off, then TM2, and TM3. And then the question is, what happens with these polypeptide chains when they are pushed out of the ribosome from the translocon? Do they insert into the membrane? Do they remain in the hydrophobic core? Do they really diffuse in the hydrophobic core until everything is there? Or do they not prop properly insert and so, and this is something you can s only really look at if you have the fragments, yeah, because you don't have nothing, you don't have the parts in the system that are not synthesized by that moment. So this is, uh, uh, gives us a handle to experimental look at, at folding of uh, seven uh, TM proteins. Okay, so I said we looked at TM1, we looked, this is looking down at all the receptors, so we looked at what is making contact interactions here in the N-terminal part, so TM1, TM, TM1, 2, and then we went for TM1, 2, 3, and, and then we also said um, there's also TM7 packs against TM1, and, and maybe it's also good to look at TM7 connected to that. And I discussed that with Fred. And the problem if you want to hook up TM7 to TM1 is that the end termini are at the same side. And so I came up with very complicated ideas of how to connect these two with, uh, with um, a chemistry, but then it would be a problem to combine that with, with a recombinant protein. And, and he came up with a very simple approach which, uh, which was much better than mine. And he just connected TM2 to TM7 and made a single chain. That solved all the problems of connecting TM7 to, to the system. Now, what I show you here is um, just from the chemical shifts, the location of secondary structure. And what you see here, the gray boxes are always the TM. So TM1, we see that the helix is there, so basically, um, if you have a full signal here, kind of this is from this uh, Talos program, um, you know that the probability for adapting a helix is large. There's always a, a short N-terminal helix um, in, the, in this D2P receptor. So TM1 secondary structure is right. TM1, TM2, you see the beginning of TM2 is a bit destabilized, but otherwise secondary structure is also correct. TM1, TM2, TM3, you see that there apparently the, at least the loop also has some helical tendency that connects TM2 to TM3. And, and then TM1, TM2, and TM7. You see that also the helices are in place. There is an uh, interrupt here, which um, is uh, because we couldn't assign some residues there. And I will come back to that. There's a reason why we couldn't assign 
uh, those part. But uh, basically, the message is the secondary structure is there correctly. Those are the proton nitrogen correlations. They all are very reasonable, so spectra that you can work with. Um, so let me start with TM1, and that was a project that Katrina did in my lab. She came to Zurich. Actually, I suppose, proposed that to Fred. I had, um, it, I had to resubmit a grant, and so we had worked on TM12, and we were working on TM123, and then I said, well, you know, in three months I need to submit my grant, and it would be nice to have also TM1 there, that's something we can do very quickly, and I think this is three years ago. We have the structure of TM1, but the whole project is still not finished. I have to apologize, but you will see later on why it's not finished. And I think it's going to be a, a nice story in the end. Okay, so TM1 um, spectrum is, this was a direct expression. I think there was a protein that worked very well. And what, what we see in the, in the structures is that um, instead of seeing one helix, so this is the overlay of the entire sequence of the first helix, we see two separate helices and then a flexible interrupt in the beginning. And there is an arginine, again, a polar charged residue that is not com making any compensating interactions. And so instead of being one helix, it's two separate helices. Now TM1, TM2, I already talked about. This is the work of Alex, say. So this is a two TM a, a, a helical bundle with in tertiary contacts in there. Um, and TM1, 2, 3. Okay, this is a long story. Um, turned out to be an extremely difficult fragment to work with. Um, the, this is the spectrum. It's a nice spectrum. Um, the problem is a little bit the protein tends to be not stable, but we could assign it. Again, this is the prediction of secondary structure, and this is the, pr uh, the probability to, to adopt a helix, and you see TM1 is in place, TM2, the beginning is a little bit destabilized, but in principle it's in place. In TM3, we see there is a, a flexible, some flexibility within TM3, but otherwise it's also in place. Um, but what was a problem is that this was a fragment that um, was aggregation prone, and so this is the size exclusion chromatogram. This is the peak from the monomer, and you see a broad peak here from aggregates, and if we kept it in solution for a little longer, for a week or so, everything was then diluting as a, as a high uh, molecular weight aggregate. And we could, we worked on this extensively. You can also see that here, in the proton carbon correlations of the methyl group, so this is of TM12, so you see all the signals of the leucine, valine, and isoleucine. Basically, you see sharp peaks. If you compare that here, you see in the proton dimension that the peaks are much, much broader. So this already indicates you that we have uh, large aggreg larger aggregates in there. We worked a little bit adding cholesterol sulfate. It helped a little bit. The, this is strips from the carbon uh, nitrogen correlation spectra with and without cholesterol. They always improved a little bit, but it's a project that we only been able to follow up to a certain extent. Um, again here, now you see the other three TM protein, TM1, 2, 7, so this is the one with the seventh helix hooked up to TM2. You see the proton carbon correlation looks much, much better than for TM1, 2, 3. And that's also the size exclusion chromatogram, so there's one peak here for TM1, 2, 7, and not the high molecular weight um, peak that we find for TM1, 2, 3. So, so TM1, 2, 7 seems to behave much better. Um, this is the spectrum. We got all the assignments. Um, now, 95% um, of all the backbone assignments, 63% of the side chain assignment, that's actually quite good for a membrane protein of that size. Um, I wanted to make a remark about the assignment process because this is something which I find is an interesting result that we want to follow up in the future. It's an idea that we had. If you have TM12 assigned already, and then you look at TM127, then the question is whether you cannot uh, adapt TM1 and 2 to the resonances of the shorter constructs. 
And if this were possible, you can use that as a general method to assign big membrane proteins by making the fragments, assigning those, and then adjusting everything onto the entire protein. And so if you do this now, this is the proton nitrogen correlation, and say we have now in the long, this is the original peak uh, from the shorter construct, and then there's a number of peaks here in vicinity. And we cannot simply say it's that peak or that peak or that peak. We cannot simply shift it on there. Uh, that, that would be too much ambiguity, and certainly many of these shift adaptations would be wrong. It would be just guessing. So we must do better than guessing. And what we do is actually we compare the proton, the nosy strips from the amide protons. And the amide proton nosy, it's an amide that's at the backbone. So most of it, what it will see is it will see its own side chain and it will see the side chain of the neighboring residues. But if there's an interhelical contact, it won't see an extra NOE because all these protons are far too far away. Yeah? So we don't see extra signals if we get tertiary contacts, new tertiary contacts. What will change maybe a little bit if, if, if there's uh, changes in side chain conformation, we see that a little bit. So what we do is we take the new strip and we, oh, so actually we take the original strip that from, from the shorter fragment, and then we compare to all these candidates uh, in, 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 the, in the new spectrum, and we do a matching uh, where the peaks are uh, uh, at the same positions. And we've done this fully automatically. So we work on spectra that are picked by the computer, and there's no human interference. Uh, we just do a pattern match, and this is, we get 95% correctly assigned for TM127 and 90% for 123. Yeah? So I think this is very encouraging because assigning even backbones on these longer um, uh, membrane proteins is a difficult task. Now during this, one thing, one more thing that's interesting of that is if you do this matching of strips, you also compare side chain resonances and the side chains you have assigned on the shorter uh, fragments, you also get the side chain assignments on the larger proteins, and this is something that is really, really very difficult to obtain on large proteins or on the entire receptors. So we think that this is a nice tool, uh, very useful, and in future, if we go on entire GPCRs, what we want to do is we want to make them as fragments. Hopefully, we we'll, can develop the biochemistry so that we can do this quickly. Uh, so we will do these adaptations, but we will probably also go back to amino acid selective labeling to help a little bit. Um, okay. So one more thing now on this TM127. We are still working on the structure. Um, the problem is we don't see really enough NOEs to build up the structure. This is a problem that is known for membrane proteins, particularly known for membrane proteins that are not so... Um, stably folded like the GPCRs. And so I, I said there's a method called residual dipolar couplings. We worked on this for a very, very long time. Um, there's not many methods that are compatible with my cells, the environments, the detergent my cells that we use to incorporate our proteins. And this is a phase developed from BAX or quadruplex DNA quadruplexes that worked for us in the end after a long trial. So all I want to say here is the RDCs and the helices are appreciable, so they show they are not average. That means that the helices don't uh, fluctuate around, but they seem to be positioned somewhere. It also seems that TM2 is a little bit different position as TM1 and TM7. Um, that itself wasn't enough for us, so we also looked at paramagnetic relaxation enhancements. And so what we did is we attached uh, paramagnetic moieties at three different locations in the protein. Um, one at the N-terminal to TM1, one between TM1 and TM2, and one at the end of TM2. And uh, those are the data here. Now what I show you is this is signal uh, reduction. So if, if it's 100%, it means there's no reduction. That means that the spin label is very far away from, uh, that the moiety is very way, uh, far away from the spin label. And if it's zero, it tells you that the spin label is very close to 
to um, the residue that you look at. And so this is now for the mutant, which has the, t the spin label between TM1 and TM2. So you see the signals around here are bleached. Then if you go towards the end of the helix, you see that the signal recovers. That's also what you expect. And what we see is, and that's interesting to us, is at the, now if seven packs against two, then at the end of, towards the end of helix seven, we should see reductions, and this is something that we do. So we have indications that seven packs against TM2. And, um, and here, um, for the spin label between two and seven, we also see reductions here into this, this region. Yeah? So we get long range reductions. Um, another thing that, that uh, we did is we looked at a spin label that's water soluble and now we'll see the reductions for all those residues that are not in the hydrophobic core. Yeah? And so when, the, when here the, the signal is, or whatever you would call the data point is low, it means it's exposed to water and if it's high, it means it's protected. Yeah? And so we'll see that everything in TM1 is protected, it's a little bit less in 2 and, and, and 7. There are some data points that are missing, but basically the TM helices are protected. We see the water excess in all the loops. That's good to know. We see water excess at the C terminus and at the N terminus, not so much here in the um, um, amphiphatic helix in front. Yeah? Um, so that shows us, together with the spin label data, that the overall topology is correct. We have a three helix, we have three helices, the loops are in the water, and the hydrophobic parts are in the micelle inserted. Uh, now, I want to go back to TM1, 2, 3 for a second. And what you see there is water excess in TM3. Yeah? So we see that TM3 is also not stably folded. Uh, there was also the, the helix propensity was a little lower here in the center, but we see that TM3 is all apparently a little bit destabilized, but we don't see it in, t in the TM7, so the t this is maybe why TM127 is, is uh, more nicely behaved. And now, um, I don't want you to look at this um, in too much detail, but now the point is what we discovered is we don't have a unique packing of the three helices against each other. Yeah? And the question is, this is a tricky problem. What you know if you don't have a unique packing is that your properties are averaged. If you have an averaged property, it's a non-trivial problem to go back to find out what are the two or three conformers that are averaged in this process. You know, and this is something we're still working on. It's, a, it's a quite a tough problem. So what we try to do is we try to, this is structures, this is the Eilers model. So this is a model that was based, modeled based on homology modeling of this D2P receptor with a known crystal structure of rhodopsin. And those are um, conformers that we calculated from our NMR data. And now what we did is we back calculated from these structures NMR properties like the PREs and the RDCs and try to find out are they somehow compatible or what do we learn about it. And what we see is now if you put the spin label here, you should see a big reduction here which we don't really see. This is experimental data and this is the the theoretical data, so there's a discrepancy, and therefore we know it cannot be entirely this form that we see. Um, if we, this is a bit a different bundle, um, we see that it's getting the, 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 the agreement with the experimental data is getting better. So um, what we believe what is happening there, and we need to pin that down within the next few weeks, is that the TM7 is unstable, and the TM7, so to say, about the protein makes a kink, a flexible kink motion. And partially you have something like this, and partially you have something uh, which may be a little bit more like this. And because of that, this interaction here is, is not so strong as you expect. So it's, it's going to be a problematic, it, it's a difficult point. But what we see is we can still do reasonable, we can still do structural work on this um, uh, challenging systems and we can learn something about this system. Um, we've also done some modeling so um, to get ideas of how the potential conformers could look like that are averaged, 
We did modeling with Rosetta. Rosetta is a state-of-the-art protein structure prediction program from the lab of David Baker. And what you see in these Rosetta models, and this is for membrane proteins, we feed in the chemical shifts and the RDCs. And you see here, actually, the program predicts the kink at TM7. So it does predict a, a CTM bundle, but it also predicts that the location, this, the C-terminal part of TM7 is flexible. So in that, it's in, somehow in agreement with our data. Do I still have? I probably run out of time, no? Okay, I'll skip over this. Um, okay, so just the final remark I wanted to make. What, what do we learn from this TM1, TM1, 2, TM1, 2, 7, or TM1, 2, 3 story? It's, it's about folding, I told you, what I think we can learn about it. The question is what happens with our polypeptide chain once it's released? And this, comes, this figure comes from a review from Bill Sketch. And so there's a different models. Either the TMs are produced and they're pushed out, and so they would be sequentially pushed out. Or they are produced and then they're pairwise pushed out, or they're produced until the receptor has been synthesized and then it's pushed out. Yeah? And so if, if I can speculate a little bit from what we've seen from the fragment, I think this is unlikely because we've seen that on some of these fragments that the TM helices, they simply won't really integrate into the membrane. So you don't have a situation where entire TMs are inserted in the membrane and they diffuse there until everything is there because they won't remain in the helix. They will go out, they will dive to the surface. So somehow I feel our data indicate that they must somehow remain associated to the translocon before everything is released um, and, and probably until the, the, the entire receptor has been produced. Okay, so what have we learned? We can make these long fragments they adopt a secondary predicted a secondary structure. Formation of tertiary structure depends a lot on the presence of polar residues um, in, in regions of the hydrophobic core. And we can predict the behavior of these um, fragments quite well with simple thermodynamic data from this Wimbley White uh, uh, whole amino acid residue partitioning data. And we have also seen that the stability increases the longer you make the fragment. So the, it seems to be like the helices mutually stabilize with each other. And with that, I would like to come to a close and would like again to particularly thank Fred Nader for this uh, collaboration over a decade, a little more than a decade now, and Jeff Becker. Leah Kuhn did a lot and Katrina did most of the work uh, producing the recombinant proteins in various types of labeling. Boris was always very helpful. And then uh, on my side, in, the, in my lab, it was mainly Alexei Neumann and Martin Poms who worked on the, on the spectroscopy and also on the biochemistry of these proteins. And with that, I would like to thank you, Fred, particularly for enjoyable collaboration. Thanks a lot, so time for one question before the coffee break that will be 15 minutes sharp. <laughs> so if there are no more questions, I, I, ah yes, so I didn't see you. So I think in the, in the field of protein foldings or membrane protein structures, some people think that lipid rafts might actually might also be an important component of the folding. And yes. How do you explore based on your results with that idea? Yes, um, I've also read about this, so I can't answer it. First of all, I, we don't have any data on that. What we've seen is a little bit in our studies on TM1, 2, 3, that cholesterol seems to stabilize the proteins. Now, cholesterol are often part of this raft domains, but also um, GPCRs have binding sites for cholesterol, so it's not really clear what the effect comes from. Yeah, and but we don't really have much data, so that I can't really say something competently. Yeah. There are questions? I ask you to join me in thanking all the speakers.
that they demonstrated the how Fred disseminated sciences all over the world.